Okay. So, hi guys. Hi everyone. Welcome to one of our talks in Develop. Um, in this talk, we'll tackle design justice as an approach to design that challenges the status quo and in parallel examine why ethics is part of our jobs as creators, inviting us to re-examine how might we create better futures through design and tech. Our speaker for tonight is Cedric Lee. He is a UX researcher at Paymongo, a Filipino company that helps Filipino businesses grow inclusively through financial technology. Previously, he led the user experience team at Cambridge University Press. Cedric is also taking his master's in communication major in media studies at De La Salle University, where his research interests revolve around the intersections of critical design and tech. Learn more about Cedric through his website, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Okay, so take it away, Cedric. Yeah, sure. Thank you for uh, that intro. Uh, thank you for being with me. I love Friday night. So hopefully you all, you guys are safe. So yeah, I'm just going to share my screen and start the uh, presentation. So yeah, so tonight we're going to talk about um, how do we make sense of design justice uh, and, and ethics. And of course, before I do that, I'd like to share a little bit about me, my background, so you know where I'm coming from. So kanina kasi, um, you've learned about my some of my credentials na, but I'll go, uh, I'll go in, uh, into more, uh, at least give you uh, some stories uh, about my, my journey. No? So, uh, nung college, uh, I took up multimedia arts. So, I focused more on graphic design and illustration. So, yun talaga yung um, parang uh, main target ko nun or main goal to be a graphic designer or an illustrator. So, as you can see here, this is me uh, some years back doing street art. And then, uh, I did some illustrations then digital. So, talaga nag-venture ako dun sa, sa space na yun. And then, during college, dun din ako na-immerse when it comes to um, student activism. So, uh, kayo yung tipong nasa student council and orgs. So, na-expose ako doon. So, I met a lot of friends. I've led a lot of, you know, um, collective actions in school and outside. And at the same time, of course, led student councils and in organizations. So, basically, doon umikot yung college ko. So, hindi talaga ako more on academic so hindi naman ako taas yung grade ko hindi naman ako DL so mas active kasi ako in terms of practicing it so that's why yung mga natutunan ko outside and inside the school uh, I wanted to be you know uh, directly applied to my hobbies passions and all of those things then eventually nung after graduate nagkaroon na ako ng work so I also pursued my my graduate studies. So dito parang sige, why not try be more academic naman or at least magseryoso naman about academic. So this is where I pursued um communication ma major in media studies. So this is one example of what we do there. Uh this is me presenting a term paper in grad school about startup. So if you're familiar with startup, so this is one of my fave K drama, uh, K drama. So, sobrang gusto ko parang, sige, ito na yung term paper ko para madali lang siya isulat. At the same time, also, um, interested din kasi with uh, disability rights. So, parang, paano kaya ako matututo at the same time having fun? So, kaya ako mas ano, nadalian in terms of analyzing it. So, parang who knew that there could be an analysis when it comes to disability representation in in a start uh, in a series like that, di ba? So, parang medyo may startup and tech siya. Pero may, may slant pala siya ng, ano, ng disability, right? So, parang uh, I wanted to extend on that. That's why parang naging interesting sa akin. And then, syempre, nung ano, nung, nung um, pero na ng job, I transitioned from graphic design and illustration into UX, so user experience. So this is where I learned about it through self-studies, um, having corporate trainings, being sponsored and all of that. So this is one example. I went to UX Hong Kong last 2018, met a lot of, you know, uh, designers, researchers, and uh, UX practitioners. So basically, um, 
still now I'm still learning about UX, but dito lang din nag-revolve. So I transitioned myself. Then eventually right now I'm I, I'm doing research na. So that's a little bit about me para lang makita nyo where I'm coming from. So I do come from a creative background. Someone who creates, someone who builds the same at the same time, someone who can also challenge us at the school and eventually have fun, explore, and you know, meet a lot of friends and eventually push myself uh, push myself to 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 learn even more. So there are three, three, three things that we'll tackle uh, tonight. Uh, so First is how might this new concept of design justice be le- uh, relevant today? What problems does it tackle and respond to? And second, we're going to unpack the principles behind the concept. And lastly, I'm going to nuance it to ethics since we're going to touch in terms of the effects, practices, and identity as well. So three things lang hindi tonight that we're going to discuss. But before that, I want to learn about your understanding of design justice. So... Uh, what's your understanding about it? No right and uh, no right and wrong answers here, since this is a discovery phase. We're learning about the concept, so yeah, feel free to share in the comments or at least if you want to unmute, uh, let me know. What's your understanding of design justice? Anyone or we'll call? Um, <laughs> I, I I I actually um for my junior thesis um. In my RRL, I put the design justice. So I'm kind of familiar with it. But basically, para siyang approach to design na that at centers marginalized groups. Is that a good DL, DR? Right. So you said that it's focused with uh, the marginalized groups. So that's a good input. Anyone else? And oh, I forgot to add. Um, so approach it emphasizes na you work with these groups are then like working for them if that makes sense because it's unfair like if you leave them out of the design process kailangan sila maging collaborators not just um you know right. users or target audience yeah right so it's about working with the marginalized community it's a good point uh anything else from the chat Any guesses, impressions? Is this another buzzword in the UX community? What do you think? What's your understanding? Okay, later na lang. So, in defining design justice, I'm going to draw from the work of Sasha. So, she's a media communications and design scholar. So, she, she, teaches, she teaches at uh, MIT and Harvard, and according to um, Sasha, design justice is a design framework. So this is one of the uh, uh, characterizations that I'm going to build upon in this uh, presentation. So according to Sasha, with her book about design justice, um, it's led by marginalized communities, something that Bea already said earlier, totally agree. But at the same time, uh, it talks about how design distributes benefits and burdens to, bar- to, to various groups of people. So hindi lang to about benefits. So when we design things or when we create things, we are also passing burdens or harms to various groups of people. So that's uh, one thing when it comes to the characterization of design justice. But most importantly, it also talks about how design reproduces and or challenges the matrix of domination. So if you, if this is your first time hearing matrix of domination, these are horrible things like white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, capitalism, ableism, settler colonialism, and other forms of structural inequality. So parang um, nilagay sila sa isang umbrella that's called uh, matrix of domination. So design justice is a framework um, evaluates that like, uh, are we reproducing the matrix of domination or are we totally challenging it or are there any, any other efforts that, um, that can shed light in terms of how we, we understand the matrix of domination? So you can check the book uh, uh, using this link. It's, it's, in, open, uh, it's, in, it's in open access, but uh, I'm going to unpack further the matrix of domination, right? So according to... To Collins, 
uh, inequality and oppression kasi are the result of several forces. So these are, again, the matrix of domination. And then there is no single force when it comes to the cause of justice. So parang if you look at this picture, um, there are a lot of forces here from capitalism to white supremacy, so on and so forth. So the intersection here is a way for us to examine kung ano ba yung effect niya when it comes to either creating inequalities or something else. So basically, uh, it's an intersection. So hindi lang siya parang single issue when it comes to looking at it uh, in a big picture. So uh, that's why it becomes dominating kasi it's interlocking, it's entangled, the power relations are geared towards into uh, more creation of inequalities rather than uh, making lives better or making more benefits to people. So if you are a designer working for disability rights, it's, worth, it's worthwhile to also read and examine class relations, gender, even nationality, and all the things that, you know, that relates to it. So that's the main gist of uh, the intersectional theory, right? So from Collins, uh, it allows us to examine the ways that these forces um, create inequalities at the end of the day. So that's about, uh, so ito yung parang, um, parang ito yung villain when it comes to uh, talking about design justice. So ito yung villain na tinatry niyang um, i-challenge or at least um, intindihan. So further, um, Sasha's book kasi, uh, explores theory and practice of design justice and shows how universalist design principles and practices erase certain groups of people. So I'm, I'm going to unpack that universalist design principles later, uh, but uh, allow me to uh, proceed muna with in terms of how the book also calls for how we should design for good human-centered design and go beyond that, right? And at the end of the day, call for building a better world through collective liberation and ecological sustainability. So parang ito yung uh, main gist ng book ni Sasha. So, okay, let's unpack. Ano ba, yung, ano ba yung problema when it comes to universalist design principles? So for example, right now, when we talk about uh, interface and experience design or human-centered design in general, uh, being a Filipino designer, a lot of my understanding came from the understanding and practices of the West, diba? And more often, that kind of understanding tends to be universalist, meaning that uh, they treat everything as if they can apply their principles and beliefs to, cert to a lot of cultures, right? So which just makes it even more problematic because, again, uh, yung, yung, yung logic pa lang ng intersection tapos lalagyan natin ng universal spec or approach, hindi siya nagmamatch. Kasi again, uh, we are composed with different cultures, different people, different practices. So universalist design principles can erase or can add other uh, different people when, when we do that. So one way for us to be aware of that is of course, again, we evaluate how we shape our design principles, how we shape our design practices practices and take a more sober look, di ba? So parang, uh, parang kailangan natin magbanlaw ng no, mga Western influences when it comes to tackling um, problems using human-centered design. So uh, let me use this example or, or, or particular work by Erin Mayer in terms of understanding um, Southeast Asian culture. So according to... Uh, the work, uh, for example, when it comes to Southeast Asia, we tend to avoid conflict. So, uh, totoo ba to? So, uh, up to you. But according to the research, we tend to avoid conflict kasi. And to us, mas okay yung mas harmonious relationship. And at the same time, when it comes to decision making, often lagi siyang top-down approach. So, hindi to parang bottom up or nagmumula sa ating decision. We're not that empowered because we always subject ourselves to authority or uh, the top level um, dito, top level uh, chain. 
And at the same time, um, Southeast Asians have generally high context cultures. Well, kasi nga, I theorize na since we have different sets of cultures, um, one way for us to cope and understand each other is, of course, to uh, immerse ourselves with different people and, of course, different cultures. So what's my point, diba? Ano ba yung point ko dito? Um, Southeast Asian culture and principles are very different from the universalist design principles that's been there, that you see online, in Medium, in Twitter. So parang, again, our identity is really different. Bakit parang, parang yung spotlight nandito sa mga, mga Western um, designers and um, technologies, futurists, as if they... Uh, if, as if they have the more ascendancy authority to dictate how we are as a, uh, as, as a as Southeast Asian. So parang ganun yung peg niya. So let's look further, no? So let's use this report again. Uh, State of Inclusive Design in Southeast Asia. Um, it says there that accessibility is still very much neglected uh, in Southeast Asia. I'm gonna be through lang very quickly, uh. Um, second, we do have diverse language ecosystem. That's very true. Sa Pilipinas pala, we do have a lot of languages, dialects, and so on and so forth. And we do have limited and stable internet connection. So I can definitely relate to that. Religious culture in the Philippines, we are predominantly Catholic. And then um, we leverage on analog and traditional ways of working. So hindi pa siya ganun ka mature when it comes to tech. Right? So a lot of low-tech parent in different areas, rural areas, for example. So uh, lots of work pa, uh, on that part. And of course, we do have low social economic purchasing power. Because again, Southeast Asian countries, uh, a lot of this are developing countries. Pa. So uh, we expect people to have low purchasing power. Like for example, in the Philippines, diba? Parang a lot are still in the in the margins. And lastly, again, um, banking for them, bank people. So a lot of people are still unbanked. They don't have bank account wherein they can uh, protect their money or at least uh, even uh, even without banks, at least a way for, for them to be financially literate, right? So this is um, the state of inclusive design in Asia. Personally, I feel like medyo kulang pa siya, but at least it uh, gives us parang a look when it comes to how we are as Southeast Asians, right? So just to recap, again, universalist design principles negates these kinds of things kasi it, it, ano, it promotes a different set of principles and cultures that often can erase you know, all these people. So um, let me tell you that aside from design justice, as a design uh, framework, design justice is also a network. So Sasha's book was drawn from this one, actually. So uh, in 2015, there were a couple of designers, artists, technologies, community organizers who gathered and created shared design principles, right, that have been refined. And later on, it became a network. So dito binild ni Sasha yung work niya when it comes to design justice. Kasi, again, we're talking about earlier about how the principles, conversation, and everything should be led by marginalized people. So, so si Sasha, um, parang ina-argue niya na uh, her book is not really the main character here. Parang ang main character dito are the marginalized people. That's why... Uh, binilad niya lang yung, yung, yung concepts and principles uh, from this network to theorize and connect that into uh, different structures of power, matrix of donation, and so on and so forth. So it's an interesting book. Uh, I, I encourage you to read it, especially if you're interested with um, critical design, AI, racial justice, lot, lots of things. So there are 10 principles, and I'm going to discuss those principles and provide you um, some examples for, for you to um, grasp what, they, uh, what does the principle mean. So first principle is about how we should uh, design to sustain, heal, and empower communities 
as well as seek liberation from exploitative and uh, oppressive system. So principle one, ganun yung peg niya. More about healing and liberation from oppressive systems. Kasi uh, being in this horrible things, colonization, imperialization, capitalism, um, male supremacy or patriarchy, this can cause trauma. And um, trauma is not really being talked about a lot, right? Especially in uh, the Philippines or I theorize even the whole Southeast, uh, Southeast Asian culture or I don't know, maybe in Western culture nga rin eh. Pero, pero ibang, ano, ibang, ano, ibang argument na yun kasi tayo yung mas affected, hindi naman sila. So trauma is a, is a, is a problematic thing. Uh, that's why I'm pegging design justice is to heal, di ba? So healing uh, the ill effects of uh, the matrix of domination and how could we um, uh, challenge or even overthrow uh, these kinds of uh, things. So also one way for us to uh, challenge that is, for example, there are a couple of practitioners and researchers that uh, have theorized a method called walkthrough method in terms of analyzing harmful cultural references and uh, assess how do we even regulate uh, users' experience. So again, academics, practitioners can create different methods for us to analyze yung mga cultural, ano, cultural harms or effects, di ba? So I wonder, um, hindi kasi ito natuturo in the mainstream setting, right? But we do have ways. I mean, there are a lot of right people out there who can devise certain methods for us to really be, um, really be, um, or take in consideration the harmful effects of either design or technology. So this is only one way. And of course, there are a lot of ways for us to um, parang theorize and practice when it comes to uh, achieving this principle or embodying it. Principle two is about centering the voices of those who are directly impacted by the outcomes of the design process. So kanina, I've been talking about this a lot. So these are often the marginalized sector, marginalized community. Uh, the peg or the approach of these principles is to center, to make them the main character, right? So because uh, they are directly impacted by our design processes. So kanina, I've talked about how accessibility is still a problem in Southeast Asia, right? And of course, in the Philippines, it's things very much true. So ito, in January lang, I'm not sure if you been count or if you've read about this news, right? So uh, there's this guy uh, who's supposed to uh, ride the, the LRT, but the elevator isn't working. So luckily, uh, merong staff there to, to help him. But again, if we center these people, then perhaps we, we would need the staff, we would need the elevator for them to have access to transportation, right? Because again, the structures, architecture, all of the designs are still very much uh, favoring uh, the able-bodied persons, diba? Right? So again, ableism yung, yung culprit dito or, or yung villain. So again, uh, if we center them, then definitely, we'll, uh, then definitely we'll be able to provide uh, worthwhile solutions for them. Maybe this person won't have to suffer from going outstairs, right? So this is just one example of how our design process can um, harm people along the way. That's why if we center them, then all the more we'll be able to be um, worry about their experiences instead of you know favoring the the privileged, the able-bodied people who has a lot of more things already that's benefiting them. So, di ba, hindi siya, uh, hindi siya equal, parang hindi pantay yung tembao. Principle 3 is about uh, prioritizing design's impact on the community over the intentions of the designer. So this means that regardless if you have pure or good intentions, 
what matters here is your impact on the community. So let's take, for example, big tech like Facebook. So remember Facebook and Cambridge Analytica scandal wherein the data, uh, the data of people uh, have been used for personal interest or political gains, um, manipulation of elections. So in a sense, big tech, design tech can hamper not only individuals, but rather democracies. Like for example, Philippine democracy. Uh, we're in, up till now, we do have a lot of fake news. We do have a lot of trolls that harass people. And at the same time, uh, the failure of big tech to regulate and address these um, manipulations, these harmful and unethical uh, ways of um, getting data, designing things, installed um, populist demagogue like Duterte, right? So uh, it allowed uh, Duterte to continue with his um, uh, problematic policies of killing people, so in so-called EJKs, and all of the horrible things. And what's more, uh, what's worse right now is that we do have a front line, uh, frontliner, uh, who is a um, who is a son of a di uh, dictator that can further um, tatter a democracy. So if you look at the effect, de ba, parang uh, domino effect siya, right? So this is how big tech, right, can. Um, tatter institutions that can definitely affect our, our lives negatively. So ito yung mga hindi na kikita na effects ng ibang tao kasi that we feel it uh, in, our, in, our, uh, in our daily lives. So principle number three is about prioritizing impact because of how impact can definitely harm uh, uh, people. Or is about Change, uh, viewing change as emergent from an accountable, accessible, and collaborative process, rather than as a point at the end of the uh, at the end of a process. So this means that change is not um, linear. Change is not a one-stop shop. Change is continuous. Change is collaborative, and change is about asking um, accountability. And change is about working uh, together. Right. So. Uh, if you know this example, uh, the certain artists uh, use art to, to protest, right? So online, uh, online, pro uh, online pro uh, protests when there were different artists who, who joined the online collective action to voice out their, their grievances through social media, through the digital means, right? So this is my contribution. But my point here is that um, when it comes to viewing change, collective action or collective power is still something that we can employ for us to topple uh, the matrix of domination and even more uh, challenge it. So uh, it's about seeking um, help. It's about seeking the, the, um, the support of others because of our shared struggles and shared experiences. So number five is about seeing the role of the designer as a facilitator rather than an expert. So here's an example of one of my design sprints that I did before the pandemic. So the story here was that there, uh, there's this teammate to ask for my advice and help for a specific problem. So I said that, okay, um, it's best to be tackled by the whole team so it's because the ideas may not uh, come from me, right? So the best idea may not come from me automatically. So my role here is not uh, a designer per se, but rather a facilitator. So being a designer, you facilitate and allow people or enable people to bring out uh, the best ideas out there. Because at the end of the day, when it comes to um, choosing the best ideas. It's not about um, position. It's not about authority. It's about what's the best idea, right? So as a designer, we don't have the monopoly of answers. We don't have the monopoly of understanding. Uh, uh, one, uh, we are more ex uh, we are more successful 
if we can allow people to generate a lot of ideas and guide them along the way, right? So this is the main point of being a facilitator rather than an expert. Because again, if I come to the room as an expert, um, all I'm gonna do is just talk, talk to them, talk to them, right? Tell them what to do, so on and so forth. And that's not really uh, being collaborative, right? Being collar collaborative means that you're able to facilitate safe conversations regardless if we're gonna fail or not. So safe conversations means that it's okay to have bad ideas because at the end of the day, uh, you're there to, to vote or practice the uh, democratic principles and to vote the best ideas out there. So yun yung point nung um, principle number uh, five. So being a facilitator than an expert. Six is about uh, believing that everyone is an expert based on their lived experience and that we all have our unique and brilliant contributions to bring to the design process. So meaning that um, it centers our lived experiences, not the, uh, not the experiences of somebody else. So for example, here uh, this is Anna Cook, who is a uh, accessibility advocate and specialist. So she's, uh, she tells here that majority of accessibility issues can originate in design. So meaning to say that if your design process or design principles doesn't uh, accommodate or, or address accessibility, then you can assume that a lot of issues can um, arise uh, uh, along the way. Uh, that's why accessibility becomes an afterthought and really harmful. While if you uh, conversely make uh, accessibility um, be uh, taught or at least be um, be evaluated uh, in the earlier stages of design, uh, then by logic, according to this data, we can preempt or we can address um, accessibility issues and perhaps lessen or fortunately remove it uh, along the way. So I theorize that this is the same with ethics. Eh? So ethics is still an afterthought for a lot of us. Uh, especially when I was starting out as a junior designer. So if we think about ethics uh, at the end, then we expect that there are uh, harm that can happen along the way, uh, whether that's um, intentional, unintentional, right? So point of this principle is that uh, your, our lived experiences from the experience of Anna here, as someone is an advocate and um, uh, a specialist, uh, brings a lot to the table and brings a lot to the design process because she uses her skills to bring knowledge about uh, accessibility. And principle seven now is about sharing our knowledge and tools with our communities. So um, when it comes to sharing knowledge and tools with our communities, uh, one example is um, making something like a um, website that empowers or gives designers tools to make ethical decisions, or maybe as simple as this, like a uh, simple knowledge sharing or talk. Uh, we're in um, the speaker here argued about designing for low internet connectivity, low tech, and how icons and gestures should be able to be understood in different contexts and not, you know, um, treated as universally, uh, as for rather as a universal norm that can be understood by uh, majority or all the people. So again, this goes back to how we shouldn't monopolize knowledge. This goes back in terms of how we shouldn't gatekeep when it comes to understanding. That's why if we go back to the, uh, if we go back to design justice, I'm not limiting you guys to the understanding of how it is a design framework or even a network because a lot of meanings can you know um, be made along the way so the understanding of design justice is for us to uh, make and as creators we are meaning makers right so how do we um how do we theorize and 
um, embed our own experiences to the understanding of design justice, especially in the context of the Philippines, right? So that's the point of um, principle number seven. Eight, so whew, I love it now. So eight is about uh, working towards sustainable and community-led and controlled outcomes, right? So what do you mean by this? So when it comes to community-led and sustainable, uh, sustainable uh, outcomes, um, uh, design has uh, evolved a lot, uh, a lot, right? So again, we're using um, popular platforms, pop even popular cultures for us to uh, forward design as a protest and coming together and all that collective action along with it. And even using, um, even using design to inform people about, um, uh, about um, social issues and make them even more engage, vigilant, and speak uh, the truth and speak, uh, speak truth to power. So this is how community-led can uh, allow us to be better designers and better individuals and even, you know, um, citizens because we are worried about the outcomes. That's why we're coming together to be thoughtful and um, yeah, be thoughtful and critical about it. So when it comes to uh, sustainability, it doesn't mean that uh, you build, uh, it doesn't mean that if you can build something, you should build it already. Hindi ganon. Kasi what if, uh, what if what you build would incur a lot of waste? So that, will, that won't be definitely sustainable in the long run. It will incur a lot of um, uh, problems along the way. So parang peg dito is good design is sustainable kasi uh, it doesn't, it, it may not use a lot of resources, but rather few resources, but the income, ah, income to like, impact can really be um, can really be felt by a lot of people. So parang ganun. All right, um, nine. So we work towards non-exploitative solutions that reconnects uh, that reconnects us to Earth and each other. So Earth here, may pagkapeg na siya ng climate justice, sustainability, so may ganun slant siya. But to give you an example, uh, I'm not sure if, you've, uh, uh, if you know this. So if you're studying in, in Manila, especially in Tramuros, so dun sa underpass, there's this guy na nagtayo ng parang pop-up uh, bookshop wherein uh, nagbenta siya ng mga used books and mga donated books. So, lagi ko itong nadaanan ng college ako kasi sa underpass yung daan ko. And um, syempre, narinig ko yung usapan nila. And sometimes, I, I talk to this guy na parang, ah, wala na kasi, wala na kasi daw pag, pag nalagay niya bang book. So, bakit hindi niya nalang eventa, ganun. So, if you know Manila, ang dami kasi murang books dyan. For example, sa, uh, sa Recto. So, so, those things. So, ang daming books doon. So, hindi na ako nagtaka na may wag pa pop-up na ganito. So, ang uh, story niyan, syempre, is that um, maraming buwibili, maraming sudyante na nagbabasa, nagdo-donate ng books, eventually, syempre, kumikita siya in all those things. And maganda pa dyan, um, kabisado niya, kung saan hahanapin, ganyan. So, sometimes wala dyan, so maghahanap siya sa ibang, sa ibang lugar, tapos, yan, i-reserve niya dun sa sa bibili. So anong anong point ko dito? So hindi naman siya nag-create ng um, something really uh, something really grand. Parang um, naging resourceful siya na parang hindi masayang to. Bakit hindi na lang natin i-repurpose or use it for something else? So dito nagmula yung yung uh, I think it, dito rin na-inspire yung concept ng pop-up na bookshop sa Intramuros eh kasi ito mas mas ano na siya, ay, mas may ponda na, right? So mas, may, may structure na dyan, may mga turista na, ganyan. So again, um, we can be inspired by what's happening organically. Eh. So hindi naman kailangan laging artificial or something that's designed. Sometimes uh, we just need to observe and, you know, parang be natural about it rather than creating a lot of voice along the way. So to me, ito yung interpretation ko, ito yung parang explanation ko na hindi siya exploitative to begin with. Kasi again, uh, we're learning along the way, 
uh, nare-repurpose na yung knowledge at the same time, kumikita pa siya, ganun. So hindi ko alam kung ano na ginawa ni Isko Moreno dito. Kasi iba na yung underpass eh, parang may ano na siya, may parang graffiti na in street art ang alam ko. But sana uh, he keeps his job or maybe he fa- found uh, some, something much more uh, better. So, okay, last principle, principle number 10. I hope you I hope enjoy pa kayo, guys. So, last principle is about seeking uh, or before seeking new design solutions, we look for it's already working at the community level and we honor and replace traditional indigenous and local knowledge and practices. So, medyo may may pagka similar to dun sa example ko kanina, right? But I'll give another example. So, if you know this issue that um Uh, the Kalinga culture and one odd uh, it's being repackaged into an online course by an outsider, right? So parang, wait lang, di ba? Parang, I mean, yeah, it's a debate, of course, but if you don't really uh, delve into, if you don't really uh, understand uh, these cultures, then maybe you need to step back as an uh, outsider and not totally um, uh, you frame things. In, in, for example, for business profit, right? Because it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, may rise when it comes to ed- educational technology, ed tech, or yung mga online courses ito. It doesn't mean na pwede mo nang dalhin yung certain culture na to dun sa medium na yun or sa space na yun. Kasi you could be You could be erasing some of its practices, identity, uh, decades of understanding, de ba? That can be erased by by this medium. So it's a um, it's a parang tal dito. It's uh, it's not an easy job when it comes to tackling um traditional indigenous and local knowledge. Uh, primarily, primarily, because Uh, ang peg dapat dito is that we honor and uplift them rather than exploit them, right? So, this is an example. This has been an issue parang yung family, parang uh, the consent is not there. Hindi alam yung extent ng gagawin ni, ano, ni, ni Nas uh, daily. So, as a creator, again, again, ba? Diba? Parang someone who creates or or has the influence and power to to reshape our understanding of Kalinga culture, parang, siya, parang ganun na lang pala kadali or kabilis, di ba? So, if hindi natin sila protectahan, if walang state protection na uh, effective, or even us as individuals, then we might lose the, uh, the culture uh, altogether because of uh, this, ano, these practices. So yeah, uh, recap. So ang dami nun. Medyo hiningal ako. But just to recap, one is about caring for communities and liberation from oppressive systems. Second is about centering the marginalized voices. Third is about impact over intentions. Fourth is about change. It's a continuous process. And fifth is about a designer as a facilitator than an expert. Sixth is about unique contributions, seven is about sharing knowledge and tools to all, eight about sustainability, community-led and controlled outcomes, nine is about solutions that reconnect us to earth and to each other, and lastly, it's about honor and uplifting traditional indigenous and local knowledge and communities. So hindi pa rin natatapos yung, yung talk, so recap pa lang yung 10 uh, principles na pwede yung gamitin in terms of guiding your Uh, your work. But this is the part wherein I will nuance the conversation already to design and ethics by highlighting this principle here that it's about uh, prioritizing design impact rather than the, uh, uh, rather than the int- intentions of the designer. Because when we talk about ethics, to me, good intentions are not enough. So regardless if you have the purest intentions out there, once you put your work and once someone consumes it or tries to experience it, right? So it can create harms or burdens to them. So to me, action speaks louder. So when you are creating, 
um, go beyond intentions, uh, make yourself accountable for your actions, and preempt what might what might happen if you create something out there. So, yun kasi yung nakakalimutan ng iba na, oh, okay, uh, maganda na may intention ko, so hindi ka naman intention to cause harm ganyan. So, that's gaslighting and removes you from the accountability. So, well, alam naman natin na a lot of the effects comes from the actual um, action itself, the outputs and the outcomes, right? Especially tangible then. So, one example is this. So, when you talk about diversity, inclusion, those things, um, it happens in corporate settings. Some of them would say that, okay, diversity, inclusion, quality are important to us, yada, yada. Uh, good press, parang talk about it on Twitter, the uh, magandang PR nila and something. But then, for the day, again, short parents actions. Diba? Pag nakita mo yung yung uh, sea level puro lalaki kung nakita mo yung mga leaders di ba puro lalaki pa rin or dominated by by men so that's not diversity di ba parang they're just tokenistic about it so this is what i'm saying when it comes to going beyond your intentions and proving it right so um going beyond uh, intentions and actually uh, putting the work out there making it happen so Uh, since nasa ethical design na tayo, so ethical design, that's nuance with design justice, ensures these things. Um, safety, care, healing, liberation, accountability, sustainability, and so and so forth. So iba na yung peg ni ethical design kapag nuance mo na siya sa design justice. ba? Diba? Like what I've said earlier that talks about trauma, talks about the matrix of domination. So therefore, if you really want to make Uh, good design that's ethical and therefore you should um, take consideration the safety of uh, the creator and the actual um, audience of the work being able to heal rather than hurt people and so on and so forth. So, um, kayo kapag meron kayong kanyang frameworks or ibang practice na ginagawa, when you know once that to design justice, ano yung pwede mangyari? Ano yung pwede create? So that's up to you to uh, to explore. So let us know if we're anything uh, thoughts about it. But if you're gonna use design uh, design justice as a design framework and um, and embed it in different um, practices like this, parang ganon yung magiging uh, understanding. Uh, Segue lang if you wanna lo- uh, if you wanna learn more about ethics, more philosophy. The good place is the right place to be. So. Uh, it's mainstream, it's popular culture, it educates you about ethics and moral philosophy. Like for example, uh, should you be doing things because they're good? Or should you, or, or is it okay to, good, to do good things even if you are se- uh, self-serving or selfish about it or you seek moral desserts right, at the end of the day? Parang paisip ka right? So it's really up to you if you see that um, Make uh, make sense, or maybe that's bullshit, bullshit to some. But yeah, say go lang. So when it comes to user-centered design, uh, for me, it's beyond the user. Because when we talk about ethics, impact, and all of those things, we're not only talking about the impact to the individual or to the user. Commonly, ito yung nagiging conversation lagi. Uh, how do we assess our impact to the user? Ganyan, ganyan, ganyan. But if we really do care about the user or to, the, or to human, then we're gonna look beyond that and see the big picture. Uh, because again, talking about inter- intersectionality, different forces at work, uh, the human or the users are still part of the society and institutions. So your, your impact as a creator can extend beyond the individual and definitely extend to society and institutions. So just circling back dun lang sa example ko, how Facebook or big tech can shatter democracy or institutions because of um, of their harmful uh, effects, di ba? So again, hopefully this will give you a different view of user-centered design, that it's really about the individual and user. 
Kasi if society and institutions are broken, definitely it will affect your users, right? So again, your, your, our responsibility cuts across different spectrums. So for me, that's user-centered design. Uh, some of you may already know this, so systems thinking, but let me share a uh, interesting book, coming book for coming into uh, next year. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, 2022. So systems thinking for designers by Cheryl Kababa. So ito, mas more on, um, mas more on practical siya when it comes to equipping designers to think bigger and engage in system thinking for equitable outcomes. I know some of you may find something practical about this talk, but this is more introductory to me. This is more about, um, is more about reflections, uh, questions, critiquing, ganun, rather than giving you some practical. But don't worry later, uh, I'll, I'll try to share some practical tips. But in terms of practicality, being able to apply and being able to apply uh, ethics and all of that through a systems thinking method, I'm looking forward uh, to this book. Because again, it's about seeing us in the larger context na hindi lang tayo na sa isang uh, room or hindi lang tayo na sa isang eco chamber hindi lang tayo parang na sa isang or we don't design or we don't design or create in a vacuum parang ganun yung yung impact niya so if you want to know more about Cheryl so try to listen um, her episode on Roots Podcast Spotify Apple so she's a Filipina uh, designer and technologist okay um when it comes to ethics, uh, we uh, when it comes to ethics, and don't palaging conversation about regulation, and the Facebook scandal is also a case of weak regulation. Because uh, we're not regulating big tech uh, effectively, right? For example, how can you expect our legislators, our politicians, to regulate Facebook and it still affects, right? Uh, to begin with, uh, are the uh, parang are they equipped with the right knowledge and expertise in understanding um, uh, technical terms, for example, right? Do they know what a dark pattern is? Do they know what Web3 is? So regulation caused harmful effects because it's like the, the wild, uh, wild, wild west na parang uh, and daming key players that can harm people. And we can't just expect Facebook to regulate or self-regulate itself, right? Because that's gonna be, um, it's gonna be uh, lopsided and hindi siya uh, advisable and proven effective lagi, right? So that's why this is where I will touch upon uh, the state's role or the state's duty to regulate um, uh, our practices, uh, regulate our outputs, and all of those things. Because as designers, for example, UX designers, uh, to me, the ganun ka clear cut when it comes to how are we being regulated. And if we are regulated, I don't know exactly to what extent. So, um, parang, sure, I know some of the laws, I know some of the standards and everything, but uh, knowing these kinds of things, hindi siya, uh, hindi siya present in, 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 in all of us, in all of our understanding. Eh. Kasi, uh, especially when we learn design in different ways. So parang, what's the state's duties there in terms of at least um, creating a shared understanding that, hey, um, this, this practice is bad, so on and so forth. So... Uh, when I reflect upon design justice, uh, it talks about mainly about justice, right? So justice, um, often, uh, meron kasing two facets yun. So muna is the retributive justice. So for example, the state will punish you because you did wrong. And that's it. So they will punish you. So they will put you in jail. But having restorative justice for the other facet, not only that state will give you 
only the commensurate punishment. Um, hindi lang yung gagawin niya, but rather they will restore you until you become integrated effectively in the society. So parang hindi ka niya papabayaan na. And to me, design justice, if I am gonna put my own understanding, mas yung slant niya na sa restorative part siya kasi it tries to uh, amend uh, the broken parts in the system or maybe topple it all throughout and create uh, new ones. So hindi siya totally about revenge and all of those things. So it seeks different solutions from different um, different actors, different communities, uh, and so on and so forth. So basically, um, point here is that uh, when we talk about ethics, how are we being regulated, and um, sino ba dapat rin yung mag-regulate sa atin? So that's a question that I am posting, uh, posting here. Kasi, for example, so, in, the, uh, in one legislation in, in Europe, um, one recent development uh, has been about this. No? So, for example, uh, it regulates on the interface design even further by putting some of these uh, safeguards, like for example, uh, online services are not allowed to give more visual prominence to any of the consent options. We shouldn't repeatedly ask a user for consent. So again, consent, parang natuturo ba to sa mga user design courses out there? How do you, how do you deal with consent, right? Um, parang, when do you ask for consent and how repetitive or how parang uh, ano yung allowed na, na way to ask for consent, mga ganun. But it says here that you shouldn't repeatedly ask a user for consent and you're not allowed to urge a user to change the setting or configuration, especially without the consent or at least informing the, uh, uh, the user itself um, to make canceling a service default. So uh, I know some of us can relate na ang hirap mag-cancel ng isang service, right? Papahirapan ka. Like, hindi mo makita yung button, nakatago, nakabaon siya, or sometimes wala talaga. So, mga ganun. And lastly, um, to ask consent, even though the users have objected to it. So, talang naman yung mga some developments when it comes to dark patterns. But this is in Europe, eh. So, this is a legislation there. So, we may, we may or may not be parang bound to this. And that's a concern, di ba? Parang out there, we do have these developments, but in other parts, no idea about this, right? So this is why important yung mga advocates, like um, this guy right here, who is really pushing not only for um, conversations, uh, in the community, but rather in the policy level, diba? So in the policy level, kasi can become regulations uh, all the way. So yun yung, uh, that could make us even more responsible and accountable for our actions because we know that uh, if, we're, if we are uh, loose and everything, and definitely there's a commensurate um, repercussions to our actions. So that's, that, that can make us even more, I know, parang, um, accountable towards design. Okay, um, since we're talking about design uh, dark patterns, no. so by the way, if you don't know dark patterns, often these are practices that um, breaks the trust of the user, like for example, consent. And these are patterns that lures user, for example, to buy things, even if you know um, they objectively and consentedly uh, parang rejected it, like what I've said here. So these are examples of um, dark patterns, right? Even misleading words that can confuse users to at least subscribe to something or buy something. So these are examples of um, dark patterns. So uh, even mga ad agencies merong standards, right? Meron pa silang council. So Paano naman yung parang sa kagaya natin na 
um, UX designer, designer, or creator technologies and all of those things. So parang, where is that, I know, where is that parang regulation or, or a body that can make us accountable? So parang up to now, missing pa. And even if it's there, it's not really enforced that much. So it's going to be a problem all throughout. But to circle back with dark patterns, so I want to know kasi, like, have you ever done dark patterns your work, career, or throughout? So I'm just gonna put a survey lang to see, ah. let's see if uh, G kayo to participate. Pero it's a short survey lang. Anonymous naman to and optional. Uh, feel free to, ano, feel free to answer in there. Gusto lang makita yung, yung pause when it comes to your experience with, ano, with dark patterns. So I'll give you around five minutes when it comes to answering it, then I'll share the results. And yeah, let me check lang din yung comments and see if kamusta kayo guys or kung ano katuwag na kayo. Let me know ah, if you can. Ayun, may nagsasagot na. Nakita ka na yung ano. Yung some of the results. So we are 10 here. Um, responses more. So we have six responses right now. Parang len pa ba? Six na, two more, seven responses. So one, five, take it out, paste the answer. The responses, but I eight responses na. Yeah, well, papa, you nine. Wow, wow, well. Sini is a figure. Take it out, stop na. Let's answer slide. There. So let's analyze. Let's just check. Gauge natin. So majority not sure. And uh, at par lang yun. At par lang yun yes and no. So ako ang assumption ko marami unsure. Primarily because again, if we don't surface the right and wrong practices, we're not aware kung ano ba talaga yung tama or, or mali, di ba? So Kaya yun yung assumption ko when it comes to dark patterns. Parang, maybe hindi talaga tayo aware, maybe because hindi ko alam kasi kung mali ito or not, or wala kasi nagsasabi sa akin kung tama or mali. So, this is where I connect um, regulations and uh, bodies that can uh, make us uh, be aware about these things. So yeah, it's good to know. Thank you for participating. And if you want to learn more about dark patterns, see, for example, uh, different types, different examples. You may, you may, I know, you may visit this site. So this is, parang this was started by, uh, started by this guy, Sihari. So she's a uh, parang deceptive design, uh, parang deceptive design. Uh, she she specializes on that, and she advocates for responsible design uh, along the way. So yeah, you might be asking Ren, uh, how might we embed ethics in our design process? Kasi hindi naman siya ganun kasi simple like it's it's broad, sometimes it's very parang um uh, symbolic and all those things. But sige, let me just share share some of the things that I can think of right now. So what you could do is if you know postmortem, like for example, a specific technology broke, 'di ba? Parang like yung iba nagpo-postmortem to analyze and see the parts and analyze what went uh, what went wrong sa nangyari bakit ba nasira yun so you could do a pre mortem like what i am saying earlier now what if we think about ethics and all of these things at the early part of our process and ask ourselves what could go wrong diba? what could go wrong parang simple prompt can give us a lot of things already na eh. so this is one thing that you could do so um, 
as designers, syempre, as creators, uh, marami tayong kinoconsider when we are designing colors, typography, and all those things. So, bakit hindi natin masama yung ethics and accessibility and all those things sa process natin, di ba? So, it's doable. And of course, you can include ethics in the conversations like during your critique, your feedback, and retrospectives. So, uh, even impose that, uh, I mean, even create uh, standards for you to follow or at least um, parang uh, dito, make it is as a uh, team uh, team requirement. So my point here is that checks and balances can help us along the way. Parang we check each other because again, unchecked power can create harms along the way. One way, of course, is to do constant research or continuous research. So I'm a researcher myself. So I do research the effects of the design of the technology and see uh, ano ba yung actual effect niya dun sa user, uh, regardless if uh, B2B ba to or B2C. So I know I'm the one who is um, telling the team that hey, this is the actual experience that you're creating. Uh, it's not making the lives of our users. Well, uh, often, uh, so it can also ask us about the why even deeper and eventually the risk. Because research is a the risking activity. Because we um, lessen the risk of either, um, either incurring harms, uh, loss of money and all of those things, resources, because we are already preempting and we are already learning fast because we are researching. So I can think of parang a way to design without research. It's always going to be, there's always going to be uh, a research uh, factor to it. So if you're designing only, again, you may want to rethink and uh, employ research uh, along the way. And of course, uh, there are practices there like inclusive design, cross-cultural design, accessible design, design justice, etc. Na pwede niyang gamitin. Parang iba-iba sila ng, ano, ng flavors, for example. So inclusive design meaning that um, all people are included. Wala kayong in other. Cross-cultural design uh, meaning that you uh, consider different cultures not make a blanket policy or blanket solution that can encapsulate them. Um, accessible design, uh, meaning that um, you provide access and quitability, especially for uh, people with disabilities. And of course, design justice, the peg in terms of um, peg in terms of asking and challenging the status quo. And lastly, again, yung policy na sinasabi ko nga kanina. Because this could be company policy. Some, some, some organizations employ design uh, ethicists. So some employ accessibility experts, accessibility designers. So again, policy siya eh. So effective yung policy if uh, created lang siya, effect, uh, created lang siya inclusively and um, uh, practice um, religiously. So, um, circling back lang dun sa diversity problem kanina when it comes to the boardroom, some companies employ um, gender quotas. So, mandatory gender quotas, right? So, ano ba yung benefit ng mandatory gender quotas? Parang, it doesn't rely in terms of the organic self-organization that Okay, bottom up approach. Let's let's push for more women in the leadership positions. Parang yung policy na yon parang hindi na muna magrelay don, but rather ay bakit hindi na lang straight up policy na dapat um yung level ng um women sa leadership, for example, mag increase like to fifty percent or in total dapat yung yung level of uh, gender or sex dapat uh, at par siya or at least you know, um, favorable or parang walang nahuhuli. So that's one example of policy lang when it comes to uh, ensuring fairness all throughout. 
and some examples so again uh spotify does their ethics when it comes to creating worksheets templates projects and these things so bakit hindi natin magawa or yung iba so you can also use this so it talks about potential effects um may effect ba to when it comes to financial insecurity neglect of basic self care rights privacy and those things so ila lang to sa mga ano um laban no ano nung ethics assessment but i highly encourage you to try to look at this because again if we can make notion templates frameworks and all of that uh why can't we make something like this that can be part of our design process so yeah we're nearing the end um just want to share a bit more that my understanding education when it comes to tech has been solely about how it should be idealized like it's for personal experience uh, personal fulfillment and overcoming social uh, social barriers it's a, so it's really about the benefits lagi parang dun ako ano parang dun ako na shape dun yung parang naging and dun na buoy understanding of it but as i mature so as i study even more as i immerse myself uh, it's now shifting from tech idealism to tech determinism already or how technology shapes society diba? so um, how tech determines what will society do how will society interact with each other so and so forth and how tech can control and dominate right so these are some of the questions that you may ask when you are designing and creating something uh this was posed also during one of my classes in grad school when doing when we we're doing uh, an application or other tech or other medium we should ask this some of this uh we should ask uh these things or maybe if we can ask even more much better so ito lang yung starting point like sino yung, sino yung um nasa control um kani interest in in as a serve what are the manipulations being done and to what extent are the manipulation effects visible and sino ba yung nagbe-benefit din sa technology a uh, privilege feel lang ba or the marginalized community parang ganun and then how do we empower people and yeah asking about who are we serving are we serving the weird the westernized educated does realize rich develop so who are we excluding along the way so to recap tech idealism nag nagbabago na yung 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 parang perspective ko into a more um questioning about who is in control and who is dominating and how things shape each other Because it's not own, it's not really about fine in uh, it's not always about fine and dandy, right? It's not always about benefits of tech. Because again, it can harm along the way. But some good news. So if oppressive systems are designed, then it can also be redesigned. Diba? So parang di naman tayo hopeless. Parang there's a lot of hope out there. So just an example. Um, Twitter. Now, uh, just uh, last year launched a bias bounty challenge. So we know that algorithms may ang mga bias, right? May, may mga bias yan. Magkakarat magkakarat ng bias yan because again, humans are created with biases and we embed our biases into technology. So that bias can harm and exclude people. But Peter wants to catch those biases. That's why parang may bounty challenge nila. So parang dito, uh, nilalaro nila yung ethics in terms of punishment, rewards, those things. So this is a welcome development. Um, often nakikita ka lang yung, yung mga ganitong, ano, uh, when it comes to um, hacking responsibly. Like pag may nakatch ka na loophole in security, you're gonna be rewarded. So bakit hindi mo i-replicate yan into something like this? How would you catch algorithmic algorithmic bias? So yeah. Um even platforms like Discord, right? So if merong um sketchy na link, 
So Discord as a platform itself would take care of the users and warn them that this may be where it's an abusive site website ahead. So again, it may pick you from sharing personal information, ganon, all those things. So nakita niyo yung laro ng ano, laro ng platforms responsibility, yung state's responsibility, our own responsibility. So if we combine all these things, um, it's gonna make us even na eh. It's gonna make even more parang humane technology. Eh. So hindi lang to about responsibility ng isang tao. It's a shared responsibility, and it can happen. And we have these kinds of examples to to prove that. So we're done. Um, just to summarize, design justice is or can be seen as a framework, design framework, and eventually a network. And who knows in the future there might be some. Um, new understandings to it, or maybe some would challenge design justice. Um, next is ethicality goes beyond intentionality. Uh, there's always actions involved and that we should go beyond the individual and extend to individual society and institutions because these things affect each other. And lastly, it's not, it's not box ourselves in terms of um, idealizing tech, but rather um, ask questions in terms of, again, who is in control, who shapes control, how is control affecting different actors in the society. And lastly, so we do have the power to redesign oppressive systems, especially when we're together. So yeah, thank you very much. So it's a lot of things. I hope we'll be able to um, how do we um, grasp it? I'm free now for any questions. But if you questions, I posted some cues for for discussion here, like in terms of how do we navigate, how we how might we make it even more actionable, may sense ba siya, and paano ba natin siya apply sa work natin, and so on and so forth. So yeah, thank you very much. So thank you so much, Cedric, for that wonderful talk. Um, so guys, if you have any questions for Cedric, you can send them in the chat. Um, first off, we have a question actually from Bianca. Hi, Cedric. I'd love to know more about how you got into studying critical design for your master's. How can people follow the same path in the future? Since they're also interested in pursuing this as well. And they're both someone interested in both academia, academia and tech. Right. So, yeah, yung course ko kasi is communication major in media studies. So, by default, it's not actually critical by default. Ah. But I know some programs abroad that what's critical to it. Uh, tingin ko ang intention behind it was that we are free to put our own parang um, influences to it. Like, for example... Um, since broad yung, yung media studies, right, it talks a lot of a lot of things. Could it could talk pop culture, uh, fandoms, organizations, fair work, and dami and dami. Pero kasi when you're doing masters, um, sa program namin, and even din sa iba, often you can shape the direction of your your work or studies. So ako, uh, since Ito na yung tag ko, kaya sinabi ko yung background ko kanina about um, creative work, some criticality and activism out there, um, human-centered design. Parang doon ko shinip na yung direction ko sa, sa master. So, mas tadalian ako mag, mag, ano, mag create ng outputs, write papers, and all of those things. So, yeah. Um, parang... Step one is to um, think ano ba talaga yung influences nyo. Parang uh, check, uh, again, evaluate your identity where is a person and then fit ba tong course na to for me and um, how can I even grow in this program? So parang paano mo siya pwede i-shape? So uh, yung akin, um, ganun ko siya sinishape. So I think yun yung benefit ng, ng, ng program na 
All right. Um, Ray is also asking, how can I apply graphic justice and ethics in advertising design? Yeah, so in advertising, I, say, I, I know that you have um, code of ethics, for example, and all those things. But uh, I can argue that uh, it may be hindi na enforce all throughout or maybe alam mo yun parang pal palamuti na lang so in terms of applying um, design justice and ethics in your in your work again go back to the questions that I uh, posed earlier like okay uh, when you create an create an ad um, who are you othering who are you excluding this are you um, creating a different representation or rather a misrepresentation especially if you're dealing with different or diverse people. So yung mga ganun, it's about um, thinking about this at, at your early onset rather than being an afterthought. And babalik din siya doon sa checks and balances since um, you can ask feedback and critique about your work. You can research about the topic even further so that you'll be informed that, hey, this topic is um, sensitive ito lang yung pwede kong uh, i-touch dito. Parang wala kang karapatan to appropriate this into another um, meaning because this will be the effect in those things. And at the same time, hopefully you'll have organization that you know puts prime in terms of making ethical uh, advertising out there. So yeah, advertising, uh, talamak dyan yung, ano, yung a lot of unethical um an ethical um, fix all throughout, diba? Yung mga controversial ads, right? So, yun. I think pwede ka mong start on that. Okay, so we have another question. Er, Bianca is curious. Would, uh, would love to see examples where you've seen design justice explicitly applied in UX projects. So, do you have any examples of such cases? Uh, well, Actually, ngayon, wala pa. So, for example, in the Philippines, parang, I think this is one of the first time that uh, design justice is being introduced in the design community. As far as I know, ah, so when it comes to applying design justice, at it is talaga dun sa UX, or, wala pa. Maybe some bits to it. Uh, maybe some are practicing this already, even without knowing the concept of design justice. So maybe in in apply nila. like for example um ayun uh, being a facilitator rather than an expert maybe if you've been able to facilitate workshops and allow people to contribute and foster say conversations well you you are already um embodying the fifth uh, principle out there so Hey, that's so lovely. I actually really love how you articulated these principles and it's, I actually really see a good future in where in design uh, design justice should should be should be something we as creators should really keep in mind no matter even no matter what field you are like I for example, I am in a very technical field of computer engineering, but I still see how designing products and software in my field, can still be a, a or a, designing products in my field can still apply the same principles that you've really articulated and talked about in your talk. So thank you so much for that lovely talk. Um, do you guys have any more questions? Okay, so seeing as I don't see anything in the chat, we could go for one of the questions for discussion that Cedric has prepared for us. So let's go with first. How do we navigate beneath the matrix of domination? Are we passive, active? How could we push back? Yeah, maybe someone could share a bit more about this. But it's more of uh, a conversation type.
Um, for me, po, at least from what I see on Twitter, I really appreciate um those who always hold like um Twitter spaces or at least um panel discussions on you know very um elephant in the room topics like um racism, sexism, the things that people don't often talk about in the industry, especially like currently I am learning more about the web free space and then it can be my job, you know, very male, um, white dominates. I really appreciate whenever um, people are talking about like how there needs to be more diversity um, and then so on and so forth, how some leaders can, you know, um, practice some, how to be more equitable for people so I think that's a way to be active because it's one thing to be just acknowledge like oh it exists like this industry is really um um we lose yeah yeah okay you got okay um, so I actually really do agree with, Bian uh, with Bianca a lot on how talking about these issues within the industries in tech uh, can be one way of navigating, navigating that matrix of, domi of domination that you talk about. And I think uh, putting active effort into spotlighting actual creators or people who, who, are, who are victims of these uh, of these. Uh, biases are actually is actually one way of I think navigating and restructuring these uh, uh, restructuring design systems that for so very long have been unethical or for has been so for so very long um uh yes unethical at the end yeah. of the day yeah very uh, true totally agree so like for example web three has been uh, mentioned right parang we're gonna um, flick on it, parang. So Web3 ba, are you still um, unprotected from the matrix of domination? What kind of um, possibilities Web3 can give us in terms of protection, safety, since it takes on decentralization, di ba? So, parang, doon sa context na yun, parang, parang natin may navigate or at least challenge it or push back. Okay, so, that's one way to I know to link it to this I know point. But yeah, totally agree with your inputs, guys. You good ones. Okay, let's uh we can also talk about the second point on how might we make the design justice principles actionable and fit in our varying context. Yeah. So this is an open question. So really curious talaga kasi syempre, uh, this is a new concept and um, I do remember some asked na, okay, what if I don't agree with some of the principles? So for me, okay lang yun. So what can you apply lang? Yun lang naman yung parang uh, important dun. And yeah, knowing this concept, how can you make it even more actionable? Parang ganun. You guys can unmute, or if you guys are also shy, you can also send in your answers and inputs in the chat. Um, there was this book I read called, wait, I'm trying to remember it was by my Mike Montero. Oh yes, ruined by design. That was he talked about the concept of a Hippocratic oath for designers. Like doctors have to take that oath, you know, just you know ensure that they don't do harm. But because design is such a new field, in fact in, in also in general, you don't have an oath like that, but you know, tech um, you know, the, what we do as technologists can be as impactful and damaging. 
like for instance what you talked about like um facebook and how it um encourages violence within countries and misinformation so i think having principles like these is a great start and i hope like maybe in the future like we could have like more discussions about ethics or even classes about it so that um technologists and designers and you know in general can like really like promise or ensure that you know they won't do um these kinds of harms in their careers yeah yeah I like the point uh when you said about you know uh, hopefully may mga classes when it comes to it because when you talk about ethics right so it's not uh, i mean the ethics of our work i mean in my experience um in undergrad yun talaga siya halos na tackle and, and that's sad kasi again para we're just package or uh, condition just to create things for the sake of it just for us to um, um, follow the demands of the corporate world or the corporate uh, context that create, create, create as if we are in a factory in those things so we are totally removed from our work diba? Para lumalayo yung sarili natin dun sa gawa natin. Which just makes it even more problematic. Kasi, again, our, identity, our identities can shape what we do. And it's really important for us to take a step back and see for ourselves, okay, um, uh, this is my principles. Um, if this kind of company doesn't value democracy, then it's against my principles, then definitely I won't work for that. Kaso, yun nga, uh, going back to the education system, it's not really talk about maybe eh, because um, di pa skilled yung iba or uh, parang hindi talaga nila uh, binibigyan ng uh, important. So, yeah, good point about ano, putting that in the educational context. Absolutely agree on that point. I myself am an under, undergrad student. I literally just came from like a design class earlier. And the way we go about things and how our prof introduced us is more of talking about design in a very technical aspect. You design for a function, but we don't necessarily hear about points that you talk about on how this design can be unethical, how we can design for communities, and how how the how our designs can have impact despite and in uh, despite having different intentions or despite having good intentions at the end of the day so that's what i really loved about this talk and that's how i really love uh uh this particular topic so moving on uh this design justice even makes sense what could we what, what could we improve extend and theorize further about design justice Um, hi. I, I have a question, but it's more related to the last uh, guide question or point. So um, I'm currently an undergrad as well. And I was wondering, so in a sense, we can't usually like rely on our professors to sort of walk us through newer concepts like this. Sometimes it has to come from us as students, right? So I was wondering, because um, in my class, I'm very... Uh, lucky that we get to do project walkthroughs and um, a lot more, a lot of um, critique sessions where we can really get the class together. And I, I'm kind of new to design justice, but I love to read up on this and include it in my project walkthroughs to slowly sort of integrate that, hey, there is this concept or framework that we could use to further reflect on like our design processes and design decisions or to better help articulate our design. By any chance, um, would you have any tips as to how to sort of like introduce it to fellow students or to fellow new people? Because I feel that, um, well, for me, um, I really enjoy the talk and for me, this is a, it's not intimidating, but I do feel that for some designers, this is, it might feel like high level or intimidating, but I'd want to be part of a group of people to sort of help break that down by talking about it in school. So, yeah, any tips? <laughs> yeah, um, bibi ka talaga is something that you are planning to do already. So, 
is making sure that there are conversations are around this ready. So even if parang absent pa yung framework or something like that, parang just think about it can ane, can change a lot of things already. And I uh, think that can be uh, a good start. So even if this is not part of the curriculum or something that your prof should teach, maybe, maybe, maybe uh, he or she should be, uh, would be enlightened about this one. And that's a good or a plus point for you because that's the role of learning, right? So not totally about education, but learning. And uh, that's about going beyond the confines of um, universities and uh, applying what you know out there to your work, even if you are still in the um, uh, still in, in, in undergrad. So, uh, in terms of communicating value, again, um, you can, of course, you should make logical connections of, okay, why are we doing design justice? So, siempre, I understand that it's still vague, symbolic, broad, high level, kasi design justice, di ba? Parang ano ba yun? Parang ganyan. But you may not, ano eh, you may not frame it as parang design justice eh. So parang, if, if kung ano yung mas simple, like for example, okay, uh, if we do this, um, what could go wrong? Parang ganyan. So hindi naman kailangan frame siya na, hey, let's do design justice. Parang in terms of the principle itself, I think that's what's more important, eh. Diba? Like, for example, let's go back to the principles. Um, yeah, like, for example, um, okay, given that we, ha- we all have good intentions about our work, but how about our impact? So, syempre, impact, di ka naman sinasabi, that's not going to be talked, no? But often, impact being talked when it comes to business impact, right? <laughs> so, I mean, why not um, pose some new understanding to it that maybe relate to business impact uh, as well? Like, for example, uh, a myth is that uh, accessibility, uh, good, uh, great accessibility won't benefit businesses. But that's a myth, actually, because the more you create more access, uh, the, more you, the more you create accessible products and services, then that's going to be a win for you because more users can um, use your platform or services. And definitely, um, you can explore that and expand it even more. So parang yun yung parang isa sa argument when it comes to uh, accessibility. Right? And even principle seven, sharing knowledge and tools, which is, of course, sharing what you know. And at the same time, maybe if you talk to people, who are directly affected by your design, um, circling back to research, then definitely that will make your design even stronger, your decisions even stronger, because you are backing your decisions with data, regardless if qualitative siya or quantitative. So yeah, a uh, few things, again, recap. Just start the conversation, and then um, research can help you so, because you generate data, eh, and hopefully data, uh, I mean, data-driven yung gusto mangyari, right? So, and then at the same time, um, push forward lang when it comes to um, having your unique contributions. So, yeah. Hopefully, that that helps. But with my experience, it, it helps a uh, corporate setting and beyond that. So, Okay, cool. And I agree so much because actually um, right now I'm an undergrad under uh, multimedia arts actually also. Um, but I came from advertising management and contrary to the advertising, it was more of a management course. And there was always this back and forth with um, creative students taking the course versus the profs on um, business decisions versus design decisions. So um, hearing you talk about principle number three and how there's a lot of myths actually if you like dive deeper and if you also if you step back and look at the bigger picture, yeah, it, it was a big eye opener for me. I'm happy that because um, for the longest time that thought in my head was always um, 
it was in it was always in the back of my head so i'm happy that it was validated through the design justice principles that yeah um just because it looks it quote unquote looks that way doesn't mean that it is so yeah cool thank you that's so bad All right, so we can move on to the last point of discussion. Um, how might we better embed ethics in our work? How might we better know the impact of our work? I guess I can start with this. Um, so how, how might we better embed ethics in our work? Um, what I really agreed about, uh, agree from the top is the set of principles that we really need to remember and we have to reflect on. I, when we have these, uh, there, this is actually something that I also learned from one of the developers' talks on having a set of principles and sticking to them. And when we create projects, like for example, uh, when I was creating a software for uh, a thesis project in, like, know, in late high school, I not only thought about how uh, I not only thought about how getting it to function, but rather when this functions, how will this necessarily affect the user? How will this uh, how will they be able to interact with it? Is this at, in the long run? Will this cost this will the software cause more problems for them? Do they feel that they uh, do, do they feel that uh, the software or this project um, is intrusive to their data, for example, is intrusive to their time. Uh, and just uh, because a lot of, uh, because of an aspect of that project was collecting data from their homes and collecting uh, like their utility data. So I, I guess starting from that, even questioning beyond what, how can I get this to function can be a starting point into embedding ethics into our work. And that's from like a technical standpoint. Yeah, that's true. Really like what you said. Because in principle, that's ethics. Eh? So that's ensuring people that you don't do harm. So in principle, ethics. Siya. And yung mga ganun is the one that's usually be, being understood. So if ganun yung language, sige, sure, push for it. Because in principle, yun rin naman yun. Eh. Parang pag sinabi mo ethics ganyan, parang... Maybe it's a big word for them. But was it important talaga? Their principles in being able to achieve naman yung, yung, ano, yung goals a hole. And I also like what you said about how it relates to making your work, uh, making the software work. Kasi that's one argument talaga to, ano, to, to tell na, okay, um, uh, our software won't be uh, parang won't be meaningful if users will won't be able to use it because of this yada yada so parang it affects uh, everything in a sense so that's how you connect it eh. so at the end of a day um, you're still doing human centered design naman talaga so if you harm your users or if you do these things and definitely no one will use your software eventually to uh, be a failure parang kaya kaya na lang gagamit parang <laughs> Okay, so do you guys have any last questions for Cedric? Okay, going once, going twice. All right, since there aren't any more questions, thank you so much, Cedric, for uh, taking the time to share with us uh, your insight on design justice and for really giving a very insightful talk. Um, so, you uh, uh, <laughs> so we'll be sharing um, the talk in a few days, um, and we'll also be plugging in Cedric's links and his work. So, all right. So thank you so much, guys, for taking uh for giving us your time and attending this event. Um, you can again. Uh, you can look at the chat for some links to develop and 
how uh, and our Discord and our website and everything else. So thank you guys so much. Take care. All right. Thank you.